Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich talks with community leaders about issues in the public safety arena, sponsored by River Ridge Hardware. Good afternoon, morning, depending on what uh, time you're watching the podcast or listening to the radio program. This is Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich with the Sheriff's Report. This is part two of a podcast that we're doing concerning the gang activity within the Spokane County area. And with me in studio today is Under Sheriff um, Mike Kittlestead. And Mike spent the last 14 years in the gang unit, um, supervisor. And he has a large breadth of knowledge concerning what is going on in, our, in the area. In the first part, we talked uh, about some of the dynamics, some of the history of, of the gang issue in, in Spokane County. And uh, we left uh, part two with uh, a discussion surrounding, um, you know, a number that uh, we get from the FBI of uh, approximately 1,504 gang members within uh, the Spokane County region, which is roughly half to one percent of uh, of the population of the, of the county and mike as you were stating um that's kind of a squishy number it's a, a direct e estimate um, and we take it very seriously about putting labels on people uh, we we take that very very seriously it is spelled out by rcw the criteria that have to be made you mentioned uh, last week that this is not willy-nilly we we have to show that there is a strong gang-related connection before we go. Um, So-and-so is affiliated or a member of X gang. And um, there are consequences for getting that wrong. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, first and foremost is the, the trust we're empowered with being in law enforcement. Um, we, we absolutely have to have the integrity to, to do this right. Um, it was a priority when I went in the unit as a supervisor um, that we 1,000% get this right. Um, and, in fact, what we did was we went through all the old ones. This is going back to 2006. Um, well, in 2006 when we started this new unit, was uh, verifying every single one that was in the system. And after that, you know, I told them it's, it's quality, not quantity. We don't need to. Uh, have all these numbers the the crimes speak for themselves if it's gang related and and the community knows uh, generally that live in these neighborhoods that are gang plagued um, if they if there's such a thing in those, those particular neighborhoods they know that there is there's gang stuff going on right and so this number is very arbitrary it's what we you know it's a number that um, the FBI generally assigns to agent, you know, communities of our size, but I can tell you that um, every single one of those designations, the the only uh, reason it's used is for intelligence to figure out. Uh, so it's in line with RCW and for the uh, for any type of uh, intelligence uh, data, and then also in case they are involved in the most heinous of gang crimes, and the prosecutor decides that they uh, want to look for a gang uh, emphasis in the sentencing, or if they want to bring up gang motivation in trial. That's why we have to keep it. Um, it doesn't, uh, besides that, there's no real benefit. And so those are the two main reasons why we do that. Okay. The next slide uh, shows the number of drive-by shootings that we have had in our community since August. And it's 11. Mm -hmm. Fairly, that is a significant number. It definitely spiked. Um, I think it was, uh, you know, the hard work of all the investigators in Safe Streets. Uh, because they have a, a pulse on what's going on in our communities and they're very engaged, they were able to figure it out very quickly <laughs> what, what the beefs are over, right? Um, and as the screen talks about some of it, it it's ongoing disputes um, and they're they're not always immediate retaliation sometimes it's a couple hours sometimes it's months later sometimes uh, we've seen over the years sometimes the retaliation they wait years for whatever reason um, and you know it's hard to explain um, but this was uh, you know the murder in 2018 um, 
goes back to encounter 2017 which then helped drive some of these current drive-by shootings so you can see from 2017 to, to 20 late 2020 they're, they're all interconnected and that is where this unit has tried to take enforcement action when they can on you know the vi heinous violent stuff like this but then also everybody else that isn't necessarily involved in the violent act but are actors involved in the ongoing disputes is trying to engage with them and sometimes they'll talk with us sometimes they wouldn't and so what we would do is we would try to roll in those trusted faith-based community members or those living in the neighborhoods older gang members that are no longer in it that can hopefully positively influence these younger kids because they are kids and trying to get them to quell it to have a ceasefire to have a truce or whatever you want to call it so we can get this under control because what happens is either people are ending up dead permanently injured or they're going to prison and this you know we have to stop this cycle you know mike um i think that's the, the piece that a lot of people forget is it that for the most part it's kids dying um the kids are the ones being put out there to do the dangerous side of it while the ogs sit back and collect the money basically um and i'll never forget when we were pushing to change certain dynamics at the state level in reference to uh, the gang issue um, the gang intelligence uh, that you mentioned uh, the rcw that you mentioned it gave the criteria um, that that was one of the things that i tried to drive home after uh, one of the activists involved in a statewide you know powwow session that they had in every community concerning this issue as far as you know gang intelligence where one of them stated that uh, you know that's great that's all we need is a bunch of eastern washington knuckle dragging cops having that type of information and i was i'll never forget the look on your face when i showed up to that to the next meeting that, that we had in in reference to that uh that community um, discussion on on gangs uh, because you you and your entire unit look pretty kind of defeated mm -hmm. um, based on that that statement uh, of this fairly high-ranking individual and um, when I walked in and I, I talked to that panel what you just said is exactly what I said I went we forget that it that these are our kids that we are putting in body bags we forget these are our kids that we're sending to prison mm -hmm. and you truly want to sit here and tell me you do not want to do anything to stop this there's only two things that come out of the gang lifestyle body bag or prison mm -hmm. i've never seen much of difference i mean if you're a gang member that didn't end up in either or you're you're lucky uh hugely lucky but you know, when we talk about this type of, of situation, um, that one homicide, that was a 15-year-old? Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. A 15-year-old killed by 17 and 18-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Let's get real. These are kids killing kids, all because we refuse to open our eyes to a horrible dynamic of what's going on in our community. Let's talk about some of these root causes. Next slide, uh, if we can, Vinny. Um, as far as why people are killing each other, and well, and Mike looking at it, I don't know if it's worth killing somebody uh, because I got disrespected. Well, right, and you know this slide is kind of the. <laughs> I think all these disputes can come back to you know some of these generic things some of them are you know retaliation for a prior you know violent act shooting homicide or something like that um but it's amazing how many of these start off online now um either on twitter instagram whatever the their snapchat they're on all of them all these platforms they're very technically savvy and that's a big difference from you know, 2006 to 2020, right? And 
but the in-person as well and being in the neighborhoods and having that, you know, in the gang culture, um, you, you can't be disrespected in front of your fellow gang members and not take action because it's shown as a sign of weakness among your own group. And it's shown as that your group is weak compared to the other group. And that has a big deal with street cred. And so that just won't happen. It always, always goes, uh, you know, someone is going to stand up, right? Um, that the parents of weakness goes right in line with that. Sometimes that, you know, some of you may shoot at someone. And then, like I said, it takes quite a while to retaliate. And I, I can't explain why, but that just seems to be a, a, something that happens. And then obviously, you know, relationships, you know, boys and girls and boyfriends, girlfriends, that kind of thing. Um, and the disrespect. Sometimes these, a lot of these disputes will start between two females two that are fighting and arguing or disrespecting each other. And that spills over into the boyfriends and then so on and so forth. And again, it's just this cycle. Um, and having the maturity and the ability to deal with conflict is severely lacking because that isn't part of this this culture you know that the hardcore embedded culture and that's what these positive role models and these mentors and all these efforts that have been done at prevention intervention sometimes it's just it's not don't go hang out with your buddies it's how do you deal with conflict resolution it doesn't always come you need to be fists and bullets it you know it's having a conversation and sometimes the maturity level is a real uh, problem with that. Let's go to the next slide and talk about some of the additional factors that are leading to, you know, this, this spike. Um, multi-generational. In the first part of the podcast uh, radio program the, last week, you, you mentioned this. You mentioned that this is a multi-generational problem. It kind of put a little bit of a point on that. Well, you know, we, we are probably in our third generation of some, uh, some of the gangs here. Um, there are some parents that were involved in the lifestyle that have completely disavowed it. And, you know, obviously they, they don't want their kids involved. Um, but sometimes they have other family members that are still in. So it's this, it's this internal fight. And then we do have uh, specific instances I know of where, um, family members or pseudo family members that have been in the lifestyle since they were, you know, in their teens or, and even middle school aged are still involved into their forties and, um, you know, handing out pistols and talking about how to be hardcore gangbangers. And that's, you know, it's kind of unbelievable, but we, we know of these kind of instances and, and encouraging them, like, if you want to be a real gang member, this is how you do it. Um, so that that is tough when they have so much influence you know when we come in from the outside and they don't know us from anybody and we're trying to explain how negative this is could potentially be for their future and they don't know us from anybody but they know who they trust yeah and they they've never they they've never really known a difference um you know after 2013 when the gang youth came to their pastors and said help us uh, we're tired of watching people die um, I was contacted by um, one of our local African-American pastors uh, Reverend Happy Watkins and Happy asked me um, to meet with him and I met with him and he, he's like Ozzy we need to find a way to break this cycle we need to find a way to get these kids some hope to find a way to get them a future and jobs really comes to play in that uh, education really comes to play in that and we um, you know with the help of a, a great lady and a type of person that you mentioned uh, that should be in part in charge of these type of efforts uh, Judith Gilmore we started a um, apprenticeship program that uh, gave kids a pathway to uh, jobs in the construction trades mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, um, the associated general contractors helped us out with with that we're trying to expand that into all the trade fields now uh, hopefully next summer we will have that come to fruition uh, the challenge is 
breaking that multi-generational influence that you just mentioned and how we actually, um, you know, get, get those older gang members to help us prevent these kids from going down that path. You, you put up uh, uh, COVID as far as uh, some of the, the issues that we may be seeing in reference to this latest spike in, in gang violence. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, a lot of the most hardcore are high school members, correct? It seems to be going that way. Um, it, for a while, it was not. It was, um, it was the, uh, I guess you call them the OGs, the, the guys who were clearly out of school and were making big money and, and <laughs> not the right way and were real negative influence and were committing violent crime. It seems to be swinging back the other way, and, which is concerning because um, they're, they, they have a chance. Right, everybody has a chance, but the the kids that are in high school, they really do have a chance to get out of this. And you know, kind of what you just mentioned about jobs, um, I, I've met very many gang members <laughs> over the years that were hardcore gang members that had a job. Right, you you go to work. I come from a family of tradesmen. I you know when when you work all day and you're exhausted, and you get home, but you have a paycheck and you have a house and you or an apartment or whatever, and you have food and entertainment and you don't have the energy to go and do that kind of stuff um, and it's trying to show the value of hard work and having a job or going to college um, at whatever level and whatever they feel it can help them out but having having a plan and like you said they they don't haven't had that influence before so even if it comes from us and law enforcement in the jeans and t-shirt realm where we're trying to have conversations and they, and we establish that trust trying to get them in contact. And we've placed or put in contact a lot of at risk with that trade program and trying to get them down a direction of success and, and confidence that they can do it. That's a big part of it is, is breaking away from the norm to something that's not normal for them and, and, and not just hanging out with their group all the time and getting them thinking about their future local judicial system which in my opinion is probably the number one flaw in everything that's going on right now because there is no accountability uh you're watching people kill people and get released um attempted murders attempted kidnappings all these things uh, they're not staying in jail for committing violent violent crimes um and i wholeheartedly agree with the 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 sub bullet point of we talk about gang violence we talk about gun violence uh, which is very much associated with gang violence uh, hand in hand we talk about this horrible gun violence within the united states but the one thing we refuse to do is hold people accountable when for when they use a gun in these type of crimes these are enhancements you can get heavy enhancements and we should be using those enhancements. And if you want to be serious about gun violence, you want to reduce gun violence, then hold these people accountable and make it very much a consequence. You want to use a gun in commission of a, vi a violent crime, period, should be enhanced. But if you're going to do it in a gang-related manner, it has to be uh, very much an enhance enhancement. So I, uh, I agree, and we've... We commiserate every Monday about this low bond and bail amount. Um, what are you seeing a little bit about that? Um, well, I think you it's an interesting dynamic because I think you've got a certain political stance that is very, you know, is kind of anti-gun. But at the same time, when we go to hold people accountable, um, they're also the ones that probably want the low bail and want, you know, want to talk about reform and whatnot. I'm telling you, the, the minute someone pulls out a pistol, it changes the whole dynamic, um, absent them defending themselves, right? But if they're using it in, the, in a felonious method uh, to commit a crime, those are serious issues. And, you know, sometimes we talk about attempted murders or, let's say, a first or second degree assault where they shot at someone but didn't hit them. The in the intent was probably there and we're just you know within inches of something going from 
uh, you know, just a discharge of a firearm to a murder. And, but the intent was very much the same. And I, I think that given just what we deal with in Washington state and, and our, uh, some of our sensing, uh, reforms that we've had. And the other part is the, the lack of the probation, um, DOC being able to really not only, you know, DOC probation's job is not just to hold people accountable. It's also to help get them jobs, get them, you know, having them check in and make sure that they're doing the things they need to do. And unfortunately they've been really hamstrung. And, um, and I, we had DOC officer, we had a DOC officer and still do in safe streets. And, and they can speak to that as well, that that's a big problem. Yeah, because basically they're supposed to help mentor them back into society. Exactly. And they can't do it. Um, not enough staffing, not enough funding, and they can't hold people accountable uh, mm-hmm. when they violate. And that's, a, that's, that's fodder for an entire different show um, in reference to this. But if we can go to the next slide, and, you know, the outcomes this year so far has been – We've had several people injured and, and one 15-year-old kid killed. And I want to stress that aspect. These are children. Mm-hmm. These are children that are dying. Three years ago, four years ago, the time kind of blends for, for me, I'm heading home, 7.30 at night. I hear a call of uh, three youths up on the north side um, pointing guns at, at people. Go up help patrol uh, I end up finding them and these are 13 14 year old kids and when I ask the the question Where, where's your mama working and then I ask where's your daddy and they he's not here not around well what do you mean he's not around okay I get it I understand what that means now mm-hmm. um out of that three, because I tried to get all three into a mentoring program, out of that three, only two, 13 and 14 year olds, I should say only one of the three, were eligible for mentoring. The other two had so many strikes that they were ineligible at 13 and 14. So don't tell me that this isn't affecting. Uh, generationally and and that this isn't uh, a epidemic in and of itself when you have this amount of kids dying but nobody wants to talk about it no one wants to recognize what's going on because folks that one death here represents a huge component of the homicide rate in the United States itself we need to get get uh, that in our minds Mike, um, let's talk a little bit about sex trafficking. We got about three minutes mm-hmm. um, to go through on, on that because that is another crime that your unit uh, deals with, and we're starting to see it increase exponentially. Right. So, in a nutshell, what we discovered was that um, in in just working gangs is that. Some of the gangs were, uh, and former gang members that were not necessarily hanging out with the gangsters, were starting to uh, dabble in this, and then they started getting into a real hardcore. Um, we constantly were dealing with uh, uh, two consenting adults. You know, don't get involved. Well, the sex trafficking that I saw, there's, <laughs> they may have looked consensual uh, to the to the purchaser, but there was not. There was a lot of fear, direct violence. Um, we had women that were, had chipped teeth from having guns shoved in their mouth by the, the pimp. Um, we had, uh, cigarette burns, all, all kinds of horrible things that would happen to these women. They trade amongst them. So, you know, between different traffickers between Seattle and Washington and LA and Las Vegas and all this. So it is a very real deal here. Um, we have two very dedicated detectives, one from the city, one from the County working specifically on that along with one or even two FBI agents. Um, it is a priority. Um, the numbers are pretty staggering on how many cases they can put together. Um, and it is, uh, it has some significant penalties. The problems have always been 
getting the victims to be able to cooperate for as long as it takes to get that case through adjudication. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's a, it's a lot of work. It's uh, very rewarding when they're able to get someone out of that lifestyle and into help, um, regardless if they cooperate with a, an investigation, obviously that would, we would like to stop that cycle just like everything else with some type of an, a, a conviction. Um, because these are very heinous crimes and and I think people need to realize that it it happens everywhere um, in the United States it's not just Spokane but it's very prevalent one thing I'd like to have you emphasize a little bit on that is and yes this is a growing gang issue this is a this is a growing gang crime issue it is they the network that the gang provides as being a, a pseudo criminal enterprise allows them to move people around, um, cover their tracks, and, and and have a network internally to uh, facilitate this easier. Folks, we could uh, uh, do uh, probably three, four parts on this. If we could go to the next slide, and. This is a, just several of the things that, uh, that we uh, in Safe Streets um, are involved in. Uh, community, uh, continued gang emphasis patrol uh, shifts, uh, assisting major crimes during investigation, several meetings with community groups. That is a huge aspect of what you all do. Collaboration with juvenile prosecutors and um, across the board at all levels and intervention attempts and that is another major aspect i do not want to leave this series with the impression this is all about enforcement this is very much about prevention and trying to find these kids a better way of life mm -hmm. we have to break this cycle and i challenge all the activists out there who like to talk about this stuff all the time but you never do anything why don't you meet me on a panel one day and let's start lining out how we want to uh, deal with these type of issues. Um, I would really like to start having those discussions. Y'all talk about courageous conversations, but I don't ever see you engage in one. This is Sheriff Ozzie Knezovich with the Sheriff's Report. Have a great day. Here at uh, River Ridge Hardware, we can match any color for you. So you need this color matched for your trim in your bathroom. Come to the color computer, stick it into the spectrometer, and allow the machine to do its thing and it will match your trim exactly. So whether it was done by water damage or a young child, we can get you covered and get it matched. If you do need to have something so that it completely disappears, I can certainly help you with that one as well. Along with the spectrometer color matching capability that can match any competitor's paint color, we have a beautiful color palette that can help you start any new project. Give us a try. Thanks for watching. Ask the host a question, recommend a guest, or check out any of our other programs on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or SpokaneTalksMedia.com. Sponsored by River Ridge Hardware.